Hello and welcome to Love Rugby League's Lunch Hour, sponsored by Betfred. Uh, no Drew today, so I'm replacing him, as ever. I'm joined by editor James Gordon. Thanks, Josh. How are we? I'm alright. I'm alright. We'll have to start, as always, um, talking about Toronto, I suppose, these days, because that's all there is in, in the news. Uh, tomorrow's the big day, we'll, we'll find out. Well, apparently so, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I think um, we had a story on Saturday this morning. Um, there's a meeting at the Super League Cups tomorrow. Um, it might not actually be get be, get decided tomorrow because apparently there is an option where they can say we need more information, which would probably drag it out a, a bit longer. And is that new information um, from the new owner? Is it? Well, I think I think I mean my understanding. I haven't spoken to I haven't spoken to anyone directly, but my understanding from having spoke speaking to people is that um, there's a bit of a concern that they don't feel like they've seen enough information about Toronto or about the new owner um, so there's a bit of a feeling that maybe what will come out tomorrow is that they'll ask for a bit more information so maybe everyone seems to you know we're all hoping that a decision gets made sooner rather than later but you know the smart money sort of suggests that um, there's going to be a bit more to come after this I would imagine it's very unlikely that for instance it's very unlikely that tomorrow it's going to come out no, Toronto won't be in Super League. I think if they say yes, then that might come out tomorrow. But if I think the only two outcomes from tomorrow are either yes, it's going to be all right, or the second option being we need more information. And that's decided by opposition clubs, is it? Is that is that the fairest way to do it? <laughs> um, yeah. So obviously, there's. I think the Super League boards make the RFL get one vote, one which vote, is the yeah. same as Wakefield might. Um, Obviously, didn't get one vote as well. I'm not sure. That, is that right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. The, the, the way it works is obviously there's a board which one a representative of each club's on anyway. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, I think it's fairly, you know, and obviously people let us know in the comments what you think, but um, I think it's fairly common knowledge or, or a fair, fairly shared opinion that it's probably not the best way of deciding things by having the club's vote. So, you know, there's a there's a bit of the the suggestions here and there. So like Leeds are very pro Toronto, for instance. Apparently Warrington and Saint Helens are quite supportive of them being in it. Um, but the likes of Huddersfield, Wakefield, and LKR have been named as teams that would potentially vote against Toronto, which you know is is a self interest thing. But then at the same time, is that their fault or is that the system's fault? I mean, you could say that they're you know they were involved in. In implementing that system, but at the same time, given the current situation, you can't really blame clubs like that for voting in their own self-interest. Ultimately, the, the issue isn't with the clubs; the issue is with the system. So you know, yeah, of course, Wakefield or, or whatever are going to vote what's in their best interest because you know that's just human nature. Um, you know, I think whether it'll happen, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I think clearly the governance has got to change and. You, Realistically, Super League should have an independent board um, that makes them decisions. You know, whereas at the moment, I mean, what's the point in having an executive chairman if all he does is collect the votes from all the clubs? Surely, if you've got someone who's getting paid a six-figure salary, he should be he should be making it not necessarily just as him as a dictator type figure, but he should certainly be making decisions independent of having to ask the clubs. Otherwise, what's the point? The, you know, the clubs might as well. You know, you talk about all the money that. The clubs are losing, or in theory, saying they're losing if they have to give it to Toronto. Well, you're spending six figures on someone to head up something that has no real power because he's got to ask the clubs all the time. So, you know, I don't know what's going on. I, I honestly don't know. You know, I, I can't, like I say, I speak to a lot of people. I honestly have no inkling whatsoever as to what's going to happen. Well, let's say that the clubs vote now, then what next year? Well, me and Drew talked about this a little bit last week. Um, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm running with an eleven-team league. Doesn't I think there's a, a few, a few. There's a bit of concern that it's it, it seems unprofessional to run with an odd number because uh, obviously that means that one team will have a week off every week. Um, there's obviously concerns about Magic Weekend because obviously if you have an odd number, you can't yes, have you, can't. you know you can't have Magic Weekend. You'd have to change Magic Weekend to maybe be in a Challenge Cup event or so something. Do you, do you open it to an application for a Championship team? I, I would say so. I mean, I'm I've been pretty. I think there's only one option. I, you know, my personal opinion is that if there's no Toronto next year, I think they have to bring Toulouse in. I think that's the 
I think that's the no-brainer option. Um, you know, and I know there's a there's a, an opinion that Featherstone should go in because they lost the million pound game to Toronto, which doesn't really make a great deal of sense in my opinion. Um, you know, obviously there was no meaningful championship season, so you can't really, you know, I mean to, to leave the top anyway, you can't really put a a K an on field case for anyone being in it. I just think that, you know, they parachuted Catalan in, in two thousand and six, why couldn't they just parachute to lose in in two thousand and twenty one? Um, Toulouse would have to be protected as well because obviously they've recruited, they've been planning for being in championship next mm -hmm. season. Um, you know, so that, you know they, it's unlikely that they'd be able to prepare it. But then I suppose you could say the same about Toronto. Um, well, yeah, of course, because half their players are not, not just going out on loan, but they've signed elsewhere on three-year contracts, two-year contracts. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, we've been looking last week. They've still got a healthy. Um, they've still got a healthy. You know, a healthy number of players, but. Yeah, I mean everyone's going to be behind the eight ball a little bit, aren't they? Um, you know, but I don't know whether there's a little bit of a discussion, and I might do a piece on this next week. We have, we've had a few. We have, we always have a few suggestions from fans writing in about how they want, um, you know, how they see the system going, and and I do genuinely think that adopting some sort of conference system, you know, is the only way forward now. Where sort of you have the overseas and the expansion team sort of in a in their own little conference and then the English teams are in their own little conference and yeah you have games between the two but promotion and relegation only affects the English clubs because mm. you know it, it doesn't really make any sense if you know if you what's the point having Toronto in a league that has the bottom team go you know if imagine if Toronto gets saved and then in, in 12 months they finish bottom and get relegated I mean what would be the point it's just an absolute just waste of time let's see we've had a few comments just pop up here um, Miranda Matthews says there's no option for Toronto for further information. They went bust and lost their place in Super League. Forget about them. Well, they haven't gone bust, strictly speaking. Um, they've pulled out of the league, of course. Matthew Morrison says relegate them and let them have a championship side of crap. Um, well, uh, if you're the Toronto and you say, like, well, we, we put you in the championship, you're, you're, you're not going to want that, are you? No, I mean, I mean, you're going to say, I don't want anything to do that then. Stan says they have to restart in the championship. I, I think that, that, that having them in championship is absolutely no. That's a no. That's not an option in my opinion. Not not just because I think, not just because of Toronto and the situation. It, it's just not fair on championship teams. You know they've already had to. The championship teams have already had to sit through two years of Toronto just spending however much more money than anyone else, wiping the floor of everyone in the league. Yeah, they lost to London Broncos in the first the first year, but it just completely ruins that competition. You know you look at. You're probably looking at it, if you, if you have you run the championship in 2021, there's five or six teams, you've probably got a realistic chance of, of winning it or getting promoted. You put Toronto in and all of a sudden it becomes you feel you know, like it becomes, like yeah, it becomes, you know, it becomes Yeah, it becomes it becomes pointless. Um uh, Louis Banks says Toronto should be reinstated and given three years to find their feet. Uh, like cover expansion teams were given. I mean, there is that argument that Catalan had that exemption from relegation. And again, that, that sort of goes back to the point about the conference system is that it's all right putting these expansion teams in, but what if they get relegated? I mean, you're not helping anyone. And the other problem is, is where do we get relegated to? Because like the Toronto guy said, it's Super League or books. Because ultimately, they can't make it work if they're not in, in Super League or they're not in a full-time comp. Same with Catalan. You know, you couldn't really imagine Catalan getting relegated and playing in championship. Um, so, like I say, for me, the more I think about it, the more I feel like that's an option where, you know, however many teams you have in it, you know, you have an overseas or conference or however you want to call it, a European conference with Catalan, Toulouse, Toronto, Ottawa, whoever in, and then obviously have the English, the Super League English conference, which has all the current Super League teams in, and then the English conference feeds down to the championship. The overseas conference doesn't feed into anything, but teams can apply to go in it. You could eventually have a French conference where some of the domestic French teams step up and become part of the, the wider Super League, and then you can have promotion relegation to the French League. You know, I think that that's probably more future-proof than the current situation. Um, you know, It's like you've got Ottawa and New York coming in. Well, what happens when they make it up to the Super League and you've got... Ottawa, New York, Toronto, Catalan, you've got four teams there with eight English, you know, and you've still got relegation. You're not, you know, if once you get to that point, it, 
the odds on one of them four teams after getting relegated would be fairly yeah. fairly high because you still have Wigan, Leeds, Saints in there. So it's like, well, the current the current format of the game and the current format of Super League isn't future proof to to get an all in teams. And that's before we even talk about teams like Newcastle who obviously want to progress and you know even teams like Lee that you know people have their own opinions on Lee, but you know they should be able to they should be able to work up to the top. Just like anyone else, as you know, everyone, it's Neil Hutchell's 500th game at UKR this week as chairman, and you know, yeah, it's been a bit up and down, but he had that opportunity where he went in at UKR, he built them up into a Super League club, they were a top four Super League club for a little while, and then they're, they're still in there. Every club should be given that opportunity, and that's why that's a good reason why we shouldn't have a closed shop, so it shouldn't just be straight licensing, and that's why I think the conference system, um, you know. The conference system should be, um, you know, implemented in my opinion. And you mentioned also there they confirmed the signing yesterday. Check the website for that. Just should they be looking at Toronto and saying, right, this is where we, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, and taking them as a learning curve because they'll start at League One and they make it all the way through, hoping to get Super League. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think um, the problem is with the the Ottawa thing is if they, what happens if they they punt Toronto out? Do you know what I mean? It just if they say to Toronto, no, you're not going to be in Super League, and then Ottawa is in League One, it's a bit like, well, hang on, it's failed and you've sort of kicked it out, but then Start you're letting it. someone else do it. And really, you know, it looks like Ottawa are pretty much going on the same path with Toronto at the moment. They, you know, they're not going to have any you know, homegrown players. It's all, you know, well, so I mean, unless they pull some rabbits out of the bag somewhere, but obviously they've recruited a lot of English-based players. Uh, which to be fair, it must be difficult. It, it's difficult. It must be difficult for them, like it's difficult for everyone. It's like you know, there's a lot of uncertainty over everything. So um, I think they'd attract a lot more people if they did have just a, just a handful of Canadian players. Well, because I think that's the number one comment is when they sign someone that's Championship English or English yeah. one player. They go, oh, where's he? Where, where's he Canadian players? If they started signing some of them, I think that that people maybe jump on board with them a little bit more. We've talk, I mean, obviously we've talked about it. We've talked about it on air before. There's a bit of an issue over work permits and stuff like that, which you know, which holds them back. There's also, you know, there's a bit of a theory that they're just not the players there. Mm -hmm. So there's just not players that are capable of playing at, at that level, which is obviously the reality of the situation. Um, you know, and, and I suppose that's where it's all. It, it, to be fair, it's not. And it depends who you speak to, but the purpose of having Ottawa in the league shouldn't be about Ottawa's first team necessarily. It should be about developing players and, and increasing the player pool. But you know, everyone's focus goes on everyone's focus goes on who's playing for the pro team. And what they're doing. Compare that to say Newcastle, for instance, who are doing loads of work in the you know in the grass at the grassroots level northeast. You know, rugby league in the northeast got a lot of you know a lot of stuff going on in the grassroots and that. Ultimately, you need that to underpin. So it's Newcastle, even at Newcastle, I mean, obviously Newcastle's not miles away, but even if they can't, can't attract players to go there, in they're playing homegrown players. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, as much as, yeah, it's not going to happen overnight, you need to be able to get to that point where you need to be able to figure out a way that you can get homegrown players playing for you as soon as possible. Now, whether that's 20 years down the line, but you've still got to put the... You still got to put sort of the seeds down now to you know to get there and 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 while some people say oh well having the pro team playing puts them seeds down doesn't you need you know you need a bit more than that and another week uh, more coronavirus updates this time it reports on on Wakefield I think they're down to, to seventeen for their clash next week and doing it tough aren't they yeah so the same about going into lockdown I think now um, yeah I mean it's, it must be difficult. Um, it must be because they've got, they'll have children go to school, they'll have wives that go to work, so there's just there's just not the money like this in the NFL to have this so-called bubble. Well, yeah, and that's it. And obviously Wakefield are saying that they may do that. Um, you know, Salford have picked up a couple of players this week because they're sort of a bit a bit lower numbers. Two um, more witness players, is it? Yeah, Tom, Tom Gilmore and Ashaw Bott. Um, I think, um, I mean, Carl Fitzpatrick, I read something, he said that... Um, it's all, and we knew this anyway, everyone knows this, it's all about making sure the Sky deal is, completed. you know, is completed. I mean, to be honest, that's why I'm a bit surprised about, we've seen a few games arranged, so there's like, if there's five games in a weekend, maybe only three are on Sky at the moment, and that surprises me a little bit, because I thought, would you not rather get 
put them all on Sky. I, so. I mean, I don't know how the decision's made, but you'd have thought that well, if Super League, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, do you know what I mean? You think, you think if Super League, you know, if Super League's got to, if Super League's got to, um, if Super League has to satisfy a certain number of live games, for instance, you'd have thought that rather, you know, what happens if they have to stop playing for whatever reason? They might have already got five in the, you know, if they play all five on Sky this weekend, that's five in the bank. Whereas they might get to the last round, and I, I mean, I don't know. Obviously, I don't know how that process, I don't know how that process comes together. But um, it is surprising that, given that fans can't go, that games are being played on a Wednesday afternoon. On the well, not necessarily. I don't think the fact that they're on a Wednesday afternoon is a massive issue. I just think, well, why are they, why are they putting being put behind the hour league at the season ticket holders only? Um, you know that that seems a bit short-sighted to me, but I suppose if you're a season ticket holder, you say, "Well, well this is what we get for buying a season ticket and letting the club keep the money." Uh, and continuing with the coronavirus, obviously uh, cases are rising, so it looks like the Champions Cup and the Grand Final are both going to be uh, played behind closed doors, and the Champions Cup's been confirmed for Wembley. <laughs> yeah, I've had a few tweets about this actually, about because you know why if there's not going to be fans there, why play at Wembley? Um, I would imagine that the RFL has got a contract in place that says they have to pay to play there and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that, and it's not quite as easy as saying, "Sorry, lads, <laughs> you know, there's no fans who are not playing." Uh, you know, and, and don't forget the RFL and, and Super League, they've got to maintain the relationships with. You know, everyone's in the same boat at the end of the day. They've got to maintain the relationships with these people for future years. You know, if you imagine if you turned around, say to Wembley and played hardball and said, "Actually, we're not going to fulfil the contract this year. We're going to play the." The chance of a final at Batley, and then, <coughs> and then next year when they say, "Well, that's no, you know, we you jump us up, we don't want it anymore." Yeah. So you've got to keep that relationship going, haven't you? Uh, your editor's column, I think, this week, you looked at the ins and outs of expansion. Uh, one of the outs was one of my own team, uh, Blackpool Panthers. I think 2011. Yeah. Let me enjoy writing that piece and finding out all the clubs that had had been. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of talk, isn't there, about expansion teams all the time, um, and it's interesting to look at how it pans out over. A, a long period because while it's happening you're very caught up in it so you know while Toronto is going on at this moment in time we're all very caught up in it but the reality is if we look back in 10 years and we say oh look Toronto came in for three years it's like to lose to lose win championship for three years in 2009-2011 most people probably don't even remember that people probably just completely completely fell and fallen off their their conscience if you know what I mean so it's interesting to look back at because in many ways, you know, rugby league's criticised for not trying to expand, and yet you look over the ten years, uh, you know, listed all the teams: the Tre- Oxford, yeah. Oxford City team, Gloucestershire City team, you know, Hemel, an expansion team down there. Um, obviously, Toulouse, Toronto come in as well, and um, South Wales, North Wales. None of them are, um, you know, M sixty two clubs. So the efforts has been made. I think the main, the main learning or the main point from all that stuff is is why is it not worked you know we, we we are putting these teams or welcoming the teams into the structure but for whatever reason it's not it's not working and i don't think it's those it's not the fault of them in, it's not necessarily always the fault of the individual clubs it's the wider encompassing of the game another key point is we talk about expansion all the time, and I've made this point before. In, 19, in 1996, there was 12 teams of Super League. 2020, well, there's 11 technically at the moment. We talk about expanding, but in nearly 30 years, the number of teams haven't gone up. And it was the same with the professional game. There was 36 teams at the start of 2010, and at the start of this year, there was 37. Mm-hmm. So for all the huffing and puffing, you've expanded once uh, by one team. Um, I think sometimes they try and be too clever and reject. I know decent setups have been rejected from from going in, um, but yeah, it's not. Nice. You know, always nice to look at that and, and dispel some myths, I suppose. Some positive news this week. At the start of this week, World Cup tickets are off to a good start apparently, which is always good. Hopefully, fans can attend them next year. All being well. Well, yeah, that's yeah, nice. going, Josh. Uh, I'm hoping to. Yeah, some some good some good games. It's not at Rochdale, is it? This isn't this year. No, no, no preview games. Uh, what's on site this week? Uh, today, you've got former rugby league centre Luther Burrell has no regrets over his war- a Super League sin with Warrington. Yeah. Um, I mean, what did you what did you make of his move? Obviously, he came in. He was a big he was a big rugby union star, and he's just I don't know if it's been the case of what's happened this year. He's just not had his chance. 
maybe they've just not had time to develop him because of what's going on. They just want to want to play play players that already know the game. He's just just not had his chance, has he? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, you can't you can't force Steve Price, for instance, to play him just because he's from big rugby name. union, a big name. If he's not good enough, or if he's not the best, if he's not one of the two best centres at Warrington. He's not going to get a game. It's as simple as that. I suppose you'd be worried that when they went into, when they come back from the restart and they've been struggling for bodies, he still didn't. I would, didn't get a game. I think the general feeling was he just wasn't. You know, he wasn't good enough. Not, you know, in terms of you know, obviously he's got pedigree as a rugby union player, but he just wasn't up to speed from a Super League point of view. The question that comes from it for me is, does it signal sort of the end of any potential? Rugby union switches. Um, the games are so you know rugby union rugby league are so different now, and they require a different sort of. Um, they both require different skill sets and different attributes. I wonder whether it's unlikely that we're going to see many players come over. Do you think seeing his case could put players off? Yeah, I, I, I do. I do think so. I mean, yeah, he's up. You know, he's he's thirty two, so he's at the back end of his. Of his career, but ultimately, you look at his pedigree as an England, in England mm-hmm. international centre. For him to come over, not really make an impact, and then go back with his, the tail between his legs. Super League's got this salary cap exemption, haven't they? Where rugby union players who haven't played before can come in and knock yeah. out on the salary cap. Yeah, it's fifty percent, is it? The year after. The year after. Although he'd not played rugby league as an adult, he played rugby league as a kid, so he wasn't coming into it completely blind. Um, so I just wonder whether you know he might be. We may. I mean, not that we see. We're not seeing many anyway. Um, you know, we've not seen many for years anyway. But you you do wonder whether that ship sort of sailed in terms of. Don't get me wrong. If if the seventeen eighteen year old lads dropping out of rugby union academies, they may well have a chance to to come over. But maybe those established rugby union players that are in the around thirty aren't just aren't going to be coming anymore. Uh, some more on site. Jamal Fogarty signs a new deal with Gold Coast Titans uh, at the end of 2021. It could be 22, I thought 21, could be 22. <laughs> uh, the Titans finished just one point behind the top eight this season. I mean, they got off to a slow start, but under the new coach and Justin, they've, they've done all right, haven't they? A little bit of an for us. Yeah, Justin Albrook, we all, I think, I don't think there'll be many people that have a bad word to say. Do you think Super League is a soft spot for him? <coughs> I think so. I mean, I, and, you know, he, as well as being a nice guy and he was always very, very good with the media. He had success on the pitch yeah, as well. I think there's Drew have a bit of a soft spot for him. Yeah, Drew yeah. has a bit of a soft spot for him. <laughs> um, I think, to be fair, but I think most of the media, media did it. And don't get me wrong, it's very easy to be, it's very easy to be nice and have a good relationship when you're doing well. You know, because yeah, you know, Steve Price is a good example at Warrington. I, you know, I've always found him. You know, I've always had good interviews with Steve Price. Sometimes he's a bit edgy. He always talks to you, but. Sometimes he's a bit edgy, and you get that sort of feeling. But you do when you do talk to him. Sometimes you can have a bit of a laugh with him and stuff. But you can notice the difference when there's a little bit of pressure mm-hmm. on someone, someone like him. Whereas did Justin Albrook ever have that pressure over here? Probably not. But it is good for Super League that he, you know, we talk about the Pathway Rugby Union. It's a good example, I suppose, from uh, a coach point of view that he's come over here, got a job at St Helens, done well, got the job at the NRL, and. He's doing, well, you know, he's doing, he's yeah, doing well. Yeah. We've got, you know, we've got David Fiat going there next year as well. So, um, they'll, it'll be interesting. They'll, I suppose, they could slide under the radar a little bit in his first year because everyone was expecting him to be the whipping boys mm-hmm. or, or whatever. It'll be interesting to see how he goes next year. It'll also be interesting to see he's not, he's not really. I don't know whether that's a sign, maybe of, of him, a measure of him as a person. He's not being back and knocked on any doors in terms of well, he could have took Alex Wormsley or whatever. You know, I don't know whether anything like that's on his radar. But um, yeah, obviously, I'm sure he'll like he'll have like Luke Thompson to come with him. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. know. I don't. The NRL salary cap situation is very complex, isn't it? And, uh, and you're never quite sure how they determine. Who goes where? I don't. I mean, I presume with, well, the Gold Coast is obviously a, <coughs> a you know a nice place to live. You look at them all going to Canberra, which is a sort of different feel. Um, it's slightly different. You you, you you do wonder how how much input the coaches have on recruitment over in Australia. I mean, they don't. They they tend to have more say over here. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
a bit like football, the same. The football models over here is slightly different to say in Europe and abroad, where it's more the it's not the coach who recruits the team; it's the director of football or director of rugby or you know um, whatnot. So. Yeah, good luck, yeah. good luck to him over there. Well, that's Fogarty, 21-22. You have to double-check the website to find out on that one. Uh, James Clare breaks down his rugby league career so far. That's the latest video on our YouTube and website. Uh, we've got the latest Ottawa Aces signings. Uh, you and Drew had a bit of fun with this, the Alphabet Dream Team. Uh, we <laughs> yeah, we're struggling for content, Josh, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. So we had A, yeah, a good, we had A, didn't we? So next up so is B. So well, I don't know. I, I wonder whether we should mix it up a bit. Keep people guessing because it's a bit boring if you know it's just going to be yeah, anyway. Right. Okay, so it could, we'll be, see what it could be anything. If it was B, any, any players that popped to mind? Kevin Brown. Kevin Brown. Brian Bevan, Brian Bailey, John Bateman, as a few I've got. Uh, Tom Johnston returns to Wakefield's 21 man squad. I don't know if he's one of the ones that's tested positive. But no, I don't think so. He well, he's okay. Okay. He's so okay. so Liam, Liam Kay got injured last week uh, at the game at Huddersfield. He's out for the season. so... Um, so he needed, he needed him back. back. So it's going to be good to see him back. Uh, some more positive news. Monty Mazzo was making headlines. I think he was on BBC Sport. It's good to see him on his road to recovery from his uh, from his injury, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, and obviously, un- you know, unbelievable progress. Yeah, really. Especially in this year where it's all been a bit doom and gloom. It's nice to see a nice story like that. I know, obviously, it was a horrible injury, but to see him smiling and and doing well and, and yeah, he was yeah, walking yeah. without crutches, I think, this week, which is great to see. Yeah, and you know that. It's incredible to see the journey from where he was to where to where he is now. Uh, un- unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, Ray Moore is back from the gossip column. Uh, you explained why fans can't return to Super League round as planned. Did you have a few questions about that, did you? Did I have some questions? I did you have a few questions? You, you put up explaining why fans can't return to grounds. I explained why. Yeah, no, I mean, um, some people ask you some questions. And that's well, a lot thing is piece. people are a bit like, well, why, you know, the argument is that why can't, why can we all go down to the shops, but Not a thousand right. people can't sit in a twenty-five thousand capacity stadium? Um, and the explanation from the government has been that it's because it's about the gathering of fans going in. You know, yeah, you're all spaced in the stadium, but ultimately there's only so many entrances that you can go so into. Turnstiles. And, yeah. and, and and you know, from the I don't know why I got this feeling, man. If when you arrive at Huddersfield, ultimately you've all got to go down that one road to get mm-hmm. to the ground, and you know you've got to go in. And if you're coming, if you're all coming on the bus or you're all parked in the car park or whatever, there's that. That that's what the government is saying anyway. That the concern is the number of people that would be mixing outside of that the, the stadium bubble. Um, I, I would imagine things are. I mean, it's so painful, you know, to have six months to think now that. You're looking at next week that have been a game with a thousand people, but now they're turning around and saying six mm-hmm. months. Six. Uh, and if you read that article, there's a few comments. I think Michael Carter from Wakefield is in there about how how much of an impact that has on planning for next year. They Michael Carter has said something really interesting about how yeah, obviously this year's been a nightmare, but they sort of felt like they could get through it, whereas. Because what was keeping them going was they knew that, or they thought they knew, if they could get to September, they could start putting team tickets on for next year and plan for 2021 as a normal year. Well, this announcement this week has pretty much shot that to pieces because it's basically saying, well, 2021, it's not going to be a normal year. We're still going to be in the back. We're still, well, who knows what's going to happen, but we're still going to be suffering with this, which means that whereas they might have put season tickets on sale and people have bought them, now people are going to be questioning, well, should I buy a season ticket because... There's no guarantee that we'll be back in February to go to the games. Um, there's some also bits about, because if it does stretch to February, March, what happens if games can't be played for whatever reason and that affects the sky money and yeah. you know the clubs, it affects the club's match day revenue. I think I think that's the that's the worrying thing for rugby because I think it had sort of, it managed to get its head round not being active this year or, or this year being disrupted but it thought that 2021 would be not back to normal completely but at least a much it's better like, year on its way if you so, was in, in charge of fixtures at this point because of the announcement would you be thinking of pushing back the 2021 season to march april in the hope uh, that things do get better and you can start selling season tickets and say let's jan- january and fans can start returning the, the big problem is the world cup isn't it at the end of the year you, yeah. you've not got much room for maneuver you could shorten the season maybe but would, would teams want to do that? There's also the fact that if players' contracts start, in many ways it doesn't matter that, well, it does, but in many ways it's not the fact that the games start in February that's the issue. 
I think it's more a case of <coughs> the players come back in November and their contracts start in November and ultimately the clubs use the season ticket money to get through mm -hmm. until the start of the season when they can start making money from games. Um, I, 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 I don't know, I mean, it's a very, we don't know what's, you know, no one knows what's going to happen, do we? Uh, but it must be a massive, it must be a massive concern. I certainly wouldn't want to be a player that was out of contract. You know, I, I think a player who's not got a contract agreed for next season must be in a pretty bad, a pretty bad place. Um, you know, unless Toronto come back in and Toronto just sign up all the players on the cheap. But if you, you know, if you're out of contract at the end of October, I think if you're not being signed by now, I think it's, I think a lot. I, I'd be surprised if any clubs are going forward and recruiting until they know. We haven't seen loads of movement. I know there's been a few signings and stuff, but there's not been loads and loads of movement. Um, and the, it may well be that there's not a, lot, a great deal of players that are out of contract, but I'd, I'd certainly be worried for them. And you know, that sort of ties into the human element of the Toronto thing. If they've got 15 players who've got contracts for next year, Toronto, yeah, Toronto don't come back, then then they're all going to be without a without a job. Um, you know, whether that should influence the decision is that's another you know that's another matter. That's a different debate to me. Either. I don't think that I don't think that should necessarily be a consideration, but hey. Talking of World Cup, there will be one international game in the Northern Hemisphere this year. You'll have to go on the website to find out more about that one. Um should we do you, do you want to make some quick predictions? Go on then Josh. So, so, so first off we've got Hulkar versus Leeds, do we? What what are your predictions oh, on that one? Uh, I back I'll go Leeds because I back Hulkar last week. And any and I've got I've got Leeds by eighteen, yeah. So we'll probably oh. go back in Leeds here, okay, I'll do it. Le not by that many. Oh, I think I said, oh, Leeds by 14, I think I said. Hull FC versus Salford? So, oh, Salford, it's a tough one, that. Salford by a few, four. Oh, well, I've got Hull, Hull by six, because I think they do a good game. And then Castleford, Huddersfield. Huddersfield, I think Casper is feeling sorry for themselves. Huddersfield, look, I mean, I went Huddersfield wait for last week, and I mean, was it last week, yeah? Huddersfield Wakefield, it wasn't. You know, won't live long in the memory, but they were much better than Wakefield, and you know they've got that new coach bounce. Um, I suppose and people forget that Huddersfield actually, Huddersfield have actually done pretty well. They just not been getting the results, uh, so I'll go Huddersfield by four. That's today's, and then I don't know if we've got quick time. I know Lucy stood there behind, so it might yeah, be an hour up. Quick time for a debate. Go on then. Yeah, so I've got here, we've got no, no Toronto, so no coronavirus, let's just focus on the pitch. The most impressive team so far since the restart, that would be my debate today. And I know what a lot of people would say here. I know what you're thinking. Um, obviously, there's, you know, there's been a lot of fuss about all KR, and they were disappointed last week, but certainly against Sailing and Wigan, the way they played, the way they took the game, the way they took the game to those teams was was good. I, I enjoyed certainly their performance against Wigan was he soaked up the first ten minutes and really went for it. She played really well, nice kicking game, you know, plenty of British players, um, you know, young players. Yeah. Uh, and then against St Helens I think what impressed me for Saint, against St Helens so much was and I know they lost in Golden Point was that they knew they were they were in the game and even when they went twenty twelve down with ten minutes to go they still, it'd be very easy to sort of give yourself a pat on the back or push St. Helens all the way, but they still managed to drag themselves back and get, you know, get the golden point. Yeah, they were lucky um, for the extra time thing. But yeah, like you say, I mean, for as much as they've had them, they've still got, they've still been heavily beaten a couple That's of it. times. Um, I think St. St. Helens by far and away the best team, I think. Um, but you, you've got to give a bit of credit to Warrington. I don't think That's, Warrington... That, that would have been my choice because they've done it tough. They had... Basically all the forward pack out a few weeks ago. Yeah, what? Well, performed well. Matty Ashton's going well at full back. Stefan Rashford's proving to be a really good player because he can play just about anywhere, which is someone you need at this time when so many players are being dropped. I think Warren am I most impressive. Yeah, so I, I think that I think Stefan Rashford's an unbelievable player. I think he's. I think the big problem for him over his career is that because because he's so adaptable, he's never you know he's never in. If you're picking a dream once 13, he's never in your rec. He's never the standout fullback or 
And I think that's just because he plays everywhere. throughout his career, I mean, I know he's been settled at fullback for quite a few years at Warrington, but he's just one of them players that you can put anywhere and he'll, he'll do a bit of a job. Warrington deserve a bit of credit for both, for, for a couple of the things that you say there. The way that they've, been, they've managed to get through despite the coronavirus, they could have called off and called off games, but they carried on playing. But I think it's more the way that the way they found a way to win, which is, you know, I don't want to bring up the always, it's always their year type stuff, but it's the sort of, they've sort of developed a little bit of a, it feels like they've developed a little bit of a spirit that suggests that a bit of a, that champion teams need, where even when they've not played well, they've managed to get over the line. Um, that's one of them. a good team, isn't it? Yeah. They're playing bad and still winning, you're a good team. Yeah, and that's the thing, I don't think they've, I don't think they've really, they've not really played scintillating rugby at any point, um, but they've managed to, to roll the sleeves up and, and get, get things done. And even when they've been behind in games and they've turned it around and faced a bit of adversity and, you know, the win against St. Helens last week gets them to, to Challenge Cup semi-final and they've got their pedigree in the Challenge Cups as good as anybody in the in the, in recent history. So, um, I still think St. Helens are by far and away the best team, but then, you know, it's what happens on the day and ultimately on the day last week, Warrington with a bit with a better team, so um, so yeah. choose one most impressive yeah. team so far. <coughs> I'm going to say, I'm still going to say, say uh, any more comments before we go? Uh, before we sign off, Stan just chipped in with Bulk and got 11 players out of contract. Um, so if you're then 11, you think you're, you're panicking on Yeah, them. I mean, and that's 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 the reality of the situation, and um. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know what I don't know what procedures are in place. Same with Toronto. Oh, you'd like to think that if the fifteen Toronto players and the eleven OKR players, whatever, don't have contracts come end of October, you'd like to think that there was some sort of support mechanism from from centrally from the RFL, and you know, obviously the RFL are losing a lot of money as well. Um, but in some ways, as harsh as it sounds. It, it, this isn't just a rugby league thing, it's affecting everyone. People are losing jobs in every industry, every sector. And yeah, okay, it's, it, it'll be sad for those players that are affected, and obviously, we hope that they, they get something something picked up. But, uh, you know, in many ways, that's just a consequence of, of the, the whole context of what's going on. Yeah, a good debate there uh, for, for the hour. But thanks for joining us, thanks for Betfred for your continued support, and make sure to check out lovebelieve.com for all things rugby league.